Dobré odpoledne, dámy a pánové, já vás moc vítám v Národní galerii v Praze, tady v kostele svatého Františka, kde jsme se dneska shromáždili, abychom si poslechli konverzaci Antony Gormliho a Meny Kalinovské o uměleckých dílech ve veřejném prostoru. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to uh, see you here in uh, St. Agnes Convent uh, in the occasion of uh, artist in conversation, Antony Gormli with Milena Kalinovská. But at first, uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Yzhi Feit, the director of the National Gallery in Prague, who would like to uh, say a few words to you. Thank you so much, but uh, you said almost everything what I wanted to say. So, so I'm uh, really honored to to have uh, such a great artist as Anthony Gormley here in Prague and uh, welcome in the city. And I do hope that will be in the future a possibility how to cooperate on a maybe bigger project. So I would love to. So thank you so much for coming here and uh, welcome on the occasion of this evening. And, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk uh, with Milena. Yeah. Thank you. And before we start, I would like also uh, to uh, invite here uh, Miss from uh, the director from the British Council, who is supporting this event. So, and she's also going to tell you a few words. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Denise Waddingham. I'm the director of the British Council here in the Czech Republic. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be playing a very small part by supporting this Q and A this evening. Um, it's actually today, by chance, it's the 72nd anniversary of the British Council in Czechoslovakia. And I can't think of a better way to mark this anniversary than to be here to celebrate one of the UK's greatest artists. So it's such a pleasure, Sir Anthony, to be here this evening. Um, the British Council has quite a long connection with you. I believe we were um, involved in your first international exhibition in Milan many years ago. And the British Council was also involved in the first field, which took place in Mexico, I think. So um, we're also extremely fortunate to have three of Anthony's works in the British Council art collection. We have a collection of over 8,500 um, British artworks, which we tour internationally. And I know that um, we've been touring Sir Anthony's work in at least 14 exhibitions since 1995. So it's such a great pleasure. So thank you to the National Gallery. It's great to partner with you on this event. Thank you. Uh, okay, Anthony, uh, it's our time now, okay. or your time now. Let's go. Um, probably just a few words about Anthony himself. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you everything that he has achieved, but maybe just a few words. He was born in London, has lived in number, had a large number of international shows as well as those in in uh, uh, UK, um, he has been in major international exhibitions like Documenta 8 in Castle, Venice uh, Biennale. Um, he has uh, really shown absolutely everywhere in Europe and uh, his works are in numerous uh, collections. Probably one of the things to emphasize is that uh, one of the major prizes for art in Britain is Turner Prize, and it's of course not surprising that Anthony won that prize in 1994. Uh, he has also been a member of the Royal Academy since 2003, uh, has been made an officer of the British Empire in 1997, and knighted in 2014. Uh, uh, despite all of these uh, major exhibitions, and uh, works in numerous collection, Anthony has remained to be uh, an incredibly nice <laughs> and generous person who has been thinking constantly about sculpture and space. Uh, I would like to uh, just read, uh, maybe at the beginning, if I may, a few of his words. He says, we are minds enclosed in bodies, 
and our bodies are enclosed in architecture. The reconciliation of mind with architecture, which I hope also includes empathic feeling, is exactly what I'm aiming for. Um, the last words aiming for is actually me. You have said it much more eloquently. But what I'd like to say here is that in 1984, Anthony made a piece called Mind. And that piece will never leave, leave me. Uh, it's a very large cloud installed on the ceiling. And I think that that particular piece really talks about all of Anthony's work. Because all of them are, in some way, a mind. Is, am I right, Anthony? Or will you? It's funny, I, I showed um, Mind in the show that Milena and I did uh, at Riverside Studios back in 1986. Oh, four. And uh, um, was it? <laughs> four. I just 84. I Can it really have been 84? That seems an awfully long time ago, but anyway, it, it doesn't terrible, make any difference. It? But, but really don't really. forget, we were, we were just small kids, yeah. right? I mean, well, uh, we honestly. Were, we, I mean, yes. we were just running around. Let's not go, let's not let's not go, go there. down yeah. mm -hmm, nostalgia mm -hmm, land. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. the, the, the point is that that work I've been trying to extract from um, the hands of Salvatore Alla, who um, doesn't own it, but he won't give it back. Uh, I showed it after after showing it. I, at, I wouldn't <laughs> give it back. At, 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 at the Riverside, it, it was shown in Milan, and that's where it stayed ever since. Um, maybe that was the date of 86. And um, no, I think you're quite right to, to refer to that. I think, you know, the... the the condition of, of our bodies is that they have a bounding edge, a skin on which light falls. And to that extent, they are objects in the world amongst other objects, whether animate or inanimate. But they contain this faculty or quality. And I, I, I always refer to the Tibetan uh, idea of uh, the sky nature of mind. What is consciousness? Consciousness is unbounded. It, it, it isn't an object. It is the opposite of an object. It has this potential of infinite expansion. And I think that, that cloud mind was, in a sense, my clumsy attempt to make an objective correlative of the transformative and ever-changing and ever-expanding nature of consciousness itself. You might say that this is a ridiculously um, uh, yeah, ambitious thing to make a palpable object that is attempting to embody uh, a quality of mindfulness. But, but that, that was the ambition, um, and maybe I've continue to do the same thing, uh, but using, in a way, now grounded, grounded that, that idea of making uh, a body in, I mean, a thing in the, the body. Um, it is said about you that you are a sculptor of space and at the same time architect of the body. Uh, and I think it's quite correct. And, and maybe now, because we are supposed to talk about your work in public spaces. Who says that we are supposed to? We, we, agreed, we agreed on it. Ah, uh, we agreed on it, okay. <laughs> right. okay. But okay. we can, we can no, no, go fine. in, fine. in any mind. direction. And so I want to ask you, um, when did you first begin to think about your work in public space? Really from the beginning? Well, I don't understand this. Space is universal, a bit like the mind. It goes, you know, um, there's space inside my mouth, there's space inside my lungs, but space as a, is, a, is, is, is rather like mind. It's, it's fully extensive, and the idea that you could 
uh, you could talk about private space and public space is a denial of the fact that space is the thing that eludes all, uh, in a way, enclosure. So, so anyway, uh, sorry, that, that's a, uh, but I know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, look, look what you found. That's amazing. So uh, this was the this <laughs> this was the the poster for the for the Riverside our Studios. Exhibition. But so you see, what I am talking about is you always placed your work and within the space, and that space was particularly selected, and it was always, always very important for you. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I haven't true. really seen any other of the, let's say, British artists of your generation, and you all started during the 80s, to really be so specific about the space. Yeah, okay, well, I think that's, that, that, that's a different question. And I think it, it, it revolves around the idea of the specific object and the, I, I would say that of my generation, uh, I, I, I think that Deacon Wilding Crag. Uh, none of them. Uh, none of them think uh, very much about the container of their work. But I, I, I think that that Judd's idea of the specific object, which you probably remember, was that an art object, and particularly a piece of sculpture, needed to refer to nothing but itself. Uh, that it was, in a way, a self-fulfilling entity. I think this is, uh, yeah, an impossible proposition. Uh, and I think that it denies one of the primary potentials of sculpture, which is that it has a dialogue with its space and its time. And so, Right from the beginning, you're quite right. I was very, I, I, I think that, that sculpture has this potential to be like a medium, like a d d dowser uses a, a willow stick to find water. A sculpture can catalyze and lead you to be in a place in a way that you couldn't be without it but that is very much dependent on that space. And I hope that's what I've succeeded in doing here, that I, I think that, that way that sculpture has um, the qualities of silence and stillness and being a thing it doesn't need words, it doesn't need a roof, it doesn't need a label, uh, but it, it kind of provides an interruption or an interrogation or, or, or a kind of uh, stumbling block, literally here, uh, plenty of stumbling blocks, that then, that then uh, qualifies your experience of that space and hopefully enriches it. Uh, let's talk about Event Horizon. Uh, uh, you may all have seen maybe some photographs of Event Horizon. It was first installed in London in 2007, uh, later on in New York, but I have also seen it, I think, in Oxford, or at least some... No, no, no that's in another time. That's another time, okay. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about that idea where uh, we have work uh, uh, really in communication on one hand with the city because it's placed um, above the streets. In London, I think they were all facing Haywood Gallery, if I recall correctly. And Haywood Gallery is on the River Thames, made of brutalist architecture. It's a very sort of strong point on the river and the bridge. And the sculptures of course have, are almost like in conversation on the one hand with 
the buildings, the bridge, the river, but particularly with pedestrians who run there and back, all rushing to work, probably not taking any notice of the space in which they are, and yet they realize that there is something there which wasn't there before. How many of these particular pieces were placed around London? How, how did you come up with the idea and who realized it? Um, it, it was um, paid for by the, the uh, Royal Festival Hall because it was the same year as the f finalizing of the re restoration of uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hall. But, um, no, sorry, the Royal Festival Hall. Um, I think it, it's really a, an example of me trying to do for, for the central London uh, River Corridor um, what I'm trying to do here with that space. Um, there were 31 works, four on the ground, four on the ground made of iron, weighing 630 kilos. They're, they're, I like mass. Egyptian sculpture liked mass. I've always thought that Egyptian basalt sculpture, but also their cast copper sculpture, understands the potential of sculpture to displace space. And it can only do that, I think, if it works as a mass. Um, I did spend a lot of time making, as it were, empty void places that were bits of dark in human form that stood in the light. But once I realized that you could actually cast from the inside of those mold works, I then also realized that you could take the work outside and that it would do this act of displacement even better. Anyway, so there are four four um, standing body forms. They're, they're, they're made um, from about 17 different molds, all subtly different, all subtly different in terms of the breathing um, ratio of the tension within uh, the body. Um, and four on the ground and 27 on the skyline. And the, the idea really, uh, in London anyway, was to make this epicenter around the Hayward at the same time as my exhibition in 2007. And I think it acted as a, as a I, I guess, a, a foil. I mean, obviously it worked also as an advertisement for the, for the show, but that wasn't the point. The point was, inside the building you had a sequence of works that were also experiences, one of which was the internalization of the elemental. So it was a work called Blind Light in which there was a, a cloud where, where um, you entered through a permanently open doorway and um, then couldn't see anything. Um, the, the same experience of being in a deep sea mist. Um, and I guess that, that Event Horizon was a way of qualifying, you could say, the, that internalized museum experience by something that interacted with daily life. And, and I think it was that. The, the, those, the works that were on the, on the street acted in some senses as, as yeah, stumbling blocks, or you know, particularly on Waterloo Bridge, where there were two on Waterloo Bridge, one facing north, one facing south, on either side of the bridge, across which, as Milena so rightly said, um, thousands and thousands of people would arrive and leave uh, for work every day. And they acted as sort of rocks in that human stream of coming and going. And people would stop and say, well, what is this naked, rusty man doing uh, in my path? But at that point of stopping, they would then look around, perhaps. The first reaction was they would stop each other. They would stop, you know, what, what's, what's happening? What, 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 and, then, and then they would realize that there was another one up there and another one. And then uh, it was very, very extraordinary, actually, just seeing how this, uh, you know, I talked about a catalyst, but this was the reaction, the reaction actually happening in real time amongst people who were not 
aware that they had become part of an art exhibition. Anyway, I think that this 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 idea of deinstitutionalizing art and and just and and and, and just seeing what, what happens when you put something in the street or against the skyline, and what 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 dimension does that give uh, to life itself? Do you think the reaction, or do you know whether the reaction to this particular work, which I saw in New York? was different between London and New York. And I know that <laughs> in New York there were some stories. Uh, I think somebody was uh, calling um, uh, even an ambulance, thinking that somebody is jumping, a very, very kind of American, you know. Let's be very practical. Of course this cannot be art. This may be somebody jumping. But later on, of course, it had a different impact. Yeah, I think that that that, uh, that was fairly common in all um, in all, all the installations. That uh, there was an instant instant reaction that these were jumpers, these were suicide um, people. But it doesn't take long, about three seconds, I think, for you to realise that this is uh, not a living, moving body, but a, sti a very still one. Um, and it wasn't my intention to um, raise consciousness about uh, about suicide, even though in Hong Kong, which has one of the largest suicide rates in terms of uh, developed um, high-density, high-rise financial centers, um, it was quite a, I think, salutary thing uh, to have, as it were, this embodiment of something that nobody was prepared to talk about mm -hmm. but that wasn't that was absolutely nothing to do with my intention um, and w what interested me I think was w what the developing and evolving relationship was over time the, the, the pieces stayed up for about five and a half months in London mm -hmm. um, and for about a year in New York um, what they became for people, where they began to see um, you know, them as part of their daily walking to work. or um, And that became, I think, psychologically and, 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 and certainly in terms of what sculpture can do, um, very interesting to me. You know, were, they, were they benign or were they evil? Were they surveillance or were they angels? Were they were they watchers that would watch out, or were they watchers that would uh, intrude and 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 in some way um, be um, interfering? Uh, and you could say this this kind of template, this this litmus test of urban paranoia or well-being. Um, was quite interesting, and actually, uh, you know, you, you could do, uh, I think, quite a lot of uh, investigation into that. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, I think I'm just interested in 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 art as a agent of transformation. Can we can we allow people to begin uh, to become more conscious of their built environment? and of each other as a result of these, what I consider to be benign things. Uh, and these two installations, or these two major projects, were in a very large city. And then you did another one called, that, that I didn't see, but I absolutely love the place where you did it. You did it in San Gimignano in Tuscany. You work with a fabulous Galleria Continua, and you place your work almost like reimagining a city as a vessel, as, as a container. Uh, and so you spread again these extraordinary works of yours uh, within the medieval habitat. I mean, the whole city is medieval, it has enormous amount of towers. It's greatly visited, and you have really uh, made the people who come there for history 
made them aware of thinking about now or then? Yeah, I think um, this, was, this was the same uh, summer that the Concordia uh, yeah, was, was grounded um, on the coast of, of Italy. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a it was a captain that was wanting to wave to his girlfriend, uh, and in the process, uh, drove a two and a half thousand ton vessel onto the rocks where it sank, uh, and uh, yeah, I made this work called Vessel. It wasn't actually conceived as a response to the Concordia, but it was a, another one of those happy coincidences. Um, it was a 27 meter long body form made out of about 38 cells. All of the cells open and uh, orthogonal, so like a, again, like a building, but placed in the Continua Gallery, which is a it's, a, it's an old theatre, mm -hmm. uh, and the head was on the stage, and the body was fell across the auditorium, um, and I think I felt the same the same relationship between vessel and uh, the another times. It wasn't event horizon; it was again a series of five body forms, one of which was on top of a tower, the others were just placed in mm -hmm. various uh, situations throughout the town. It was a, it was a way of yeah, uh, internalizing, you could say, the notion of a city or the collective habitat of a human, the human species, uh, and then externalizing the body uh, in places um, which I thought would 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 work, um, and I sort of wanted to have this idea of a common level. Um, so some of them some of them were 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 let into the pavement, uh, so that their feet were below the surface. Um, San Gimignano is a funny place because it's really a it's a totally intact medieval town uh, mm -hmm. that is now full of. Um, well, I was going to say American tourists, but in fact, it's Chinese, Japanese, um, Americans, and, and indeed tourists from absolutely everywhere. And then the place, uh, and then another piece which uh, completely abandoned all of the cities is your horizon field, uh, 2010 to 2012. It took place in Austrian Alps. A hundred sculptures were spread over 150 square kilometers and uh, spread around in the area. Sometimes you couldn't even see them. So here you embedded them in nature. You left them there to be covered with snow um, within the landscape. And at the time during one of the interviews, and I don't know whether it was related to this particular piece, you said, we arrived 140,000 years ago, and we have six billion years left. I'm thinking about, yeah, the, the hominin um, expansion of consciousness. Um, I'm, I'm in the middle of <laughs> researching for a film that I'm making with the BBC about the first artists, and it seems like um, our assumptions about the superiority of our own um, uh, species is maybe a little uh, premature because it's very clear that the Neanderthal is being repatriated. Um, it's clear that Neanderthals weren't um, vegetarian brutes without fire, but they actually had music, dance, language, and indeed art. And the, the extraordinary um, paintings in La Pareja in northern Spain um, show us very clearly that they had the evolution uh, in, in, yeah, uh, well, well, um, in advance of sapiens, sapiens, uh, of symbolic language uh, in all forms. Um, but anyway, uh, I guess this, 
this question is really about, you know, what what is the work doing uh, using the body, and how is it different uh, from the way it's been used before? I think, broadly speaking, it is being is it's being used to ask a question, que a question, you know, what what is a human being, and uh, can we test the idea of a human being against the world that the human being has made? So against the megalopolis, uh, you know, London, New York, Hong Kong, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Can we test the idea of a, of what is a human being, or ask that question, what is a human being, uh, in a natural environment? Uh, uh, at 2,030 meters above mean sea level, that was an absolute horizontal. You know, that went went uh, one contour. It basically made one contour around about seven valleys. Um, and I guess you know that, that that's the big question. Then, so you know, what what do we mean today when we talk about human nature? Uh, have we not extended and complicated nature? I mean, I think we have to consider ourselves as part of nature. Um, but in the time of the Anthropocene, uh, the first time in the history of uh, this planet that a single species has transformed a geological era, um, we have a very, I think we have a very serious question. Uh, I could say that the, the, if we think about human evolution and the revolutions that have happened within it, from being hunter-gatherer to being farmers, from being farmers to being um, merchants, from being merchants to being industrialists, from being industrialists to being uh, dealers in information, um, where do we stop? Uh, where do we stop our own, in a way, voracious expansion? Uh, is there something... Is, is the idea of sustainable development a myth? And what does culture have to do uh, with this question about what our, what our species is and what our relationship is with the, with the planet uh, on which we depend? So the, the, this... You know, could say that these are hopeless, hopelessly enormous philosophical questions that art is not capable of dealing with. But I think that there's an urgency in this um, that makes me not have any other choice. Um, the 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 idea of of uh, art as a as a privatized uh, gallery based. Uh, Pursuit uh, with recondite rules and uh, and only those with the adequate bank balance to engage in it just seems to me to be a denial of of, of its uh, centrality and certainly in the researches that I'm making now it's really extraordinary how central art making is to actually the human story mm -hmm. and to our survival. Um, and I'd like to feel that it could be again. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, uh, why don't we open it to questions or to conversation with all of you? I mean, I can see people here from, you know, different eras and, and you are interested in the different, many of you are interested in art from different periods. And maybe we can really have a dialogue or any kind of questions that you can ask Anthony. And if you are not going to ask, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Is that allowed? Do we Is have another allowed? one of these? Or we, we could share that. And I, yeah, I, can I, give, can I can give this to whoever. Mm. Okay. Ano. Ale nějaký komentář. Sorry, this isn't a competition. Jste <laughs> Hi, Anthony. Um, I have a I have a question about um, uh, do you do you reflect um, 
gender in your artwork or, or not? Uh, I've, I've answered that question before, believe it or not. Um, the, the, I, I, didn't, I didn't choose what, what uh, sex I would turn out. The, the, um, at the point of the gamete mitosis, um, I, I was not consulted uh, and I turned out to have a penis. Um, I didn't ask for it, I've got it. Uh, that's the body that I have to work with. I would like to think that uh, the work is, well, it's the body that I've got. I think the, um, I would say that I have tried to uh, use it to make an open place that demands it demands a certain participation of the viewer. And actually, for me, the sex of the body is neither relevant nor, in most of the work, particularly represented. Uh, I think that the work is waiting for a viewer to occupy the space that it, that it identifies. I think that questions of mortality are more important than questions of sexuality in the work. And I would say that the, the invitation is one of uh, empathy. And so this question of living or dying you could say that sexuality itself has become, in, in a sense, uh, a kind of commerce. And I, 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 I resist it. So, um, yes, the bodies come from a male body, but I don't think it, for me anyway, that's not the point. And if I failed to make the work open enough for those of any sexual orientation to feel that this is occupiable. That's my failure. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Maybe I have some, some question. I think I've read somewhere you, you studied philosophy before. And uh, I would like to ask you what kind of philosophy uh, has uh, impact or influence to your work, and if you have some idea about that. I'm, <laughs> I never, I, I'm still studying philosophy, if you like. Uh, I never studied it uh, principally. I, 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 did, I went to Cambridge and I studied anthropology and archaeology and then the history of art. And I think through those things I've become interested in a whole range of philosophies. I think um, the, the School of Frankfurt was very important to me at a certain time. So Herbert Marcuse and Horkheimer um, uh, and Adorno, uh, what they represented. Um, I think that Karl Popper was very important to me, uh, his notions of the open society. Um, uh, I uh, think Richard Rorty is very interesting. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm an amateur. Uh, I make material propositions <laughs> that don't have to um, formulate themselves into, into syllogisms. Um, but at the same time, I think that uh, I think that thinking is a f is is a tool, uh, and I would like to think that the work is a tool for thinking. Thinking is a tool to make the work. The work is then a tool for further thinking, but it isn't just my thinking. That's my hope. That's I think the hope of all artists. I'm just like everybody else, trying to make sense of being alive. I do it by, by making things and, and I think making is my form of thinking. I think 
with the things that I make, and I, I, I think that that materialization of thought is more important to me than, in a way, uh, using logic per se to identify the distinctions between a priori and, and experiential truth. I think that, that sculpture for me is, it's a call, it's a call to re-route consciousness in first-hand experience and to recognize the palpability of intelligence. I think of you know, the, the skin that's, that surrounds our body is, is as much part of our brain as the brain. Uh, the, the ability of sculpture to reorientate our attention so you know, my my hope with this <laughs> installation in St Agnes is that that r really just by the presence of this you could say dispersed infection of the space the the viewer becomes more aware of their passage through space time of light of volume of materiality of acoustic of 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 everything um that's a huge demand, you could say. It's a demand about uh, of the sculpture, but it's also a demand that I make to the to the viewer. And I say, you're not just a viewer. You are you you are a participant. You are not just a passive consumer of a spectacle. You are the generator of a form of truth and a generator of a kind of experience. Anyway. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, of course, are talking about uh, contemporary sculpture, but maybe if we ask uh, some of our experts about historical works, historical sculptures, um, they had a very similar message. Uh, and that message is really to be uh, really thinking. It's not necessarily just uh, seeing how the work was made but what the work represented. And um, I'm sure that some of the most exquisite work, uh, some of the most powerful, even for us today, is medieval. What do you think, Yuri? This time I can call you. Thank you. Yeah, this is quite a difficult question to be answered, because uh, there is, of course, certain tension of the medieval works to, to show the minds. So this is not only about the materiality, so this is somehow uh, close to what Anthony was saying. Uh, on the other side, they are very much focused on, on uh, depiction of matters which one cannot really depict, which is actually the mystery uh, of Jesus Christ and this, and his, and his life and his sacrifice. So uh, this is something what, well, this could be quite interesting actually to ask you whether, what do you, uh, how is your notion actually of these old past st statues, figures, uh, middle ages, uh, medieval art, do you see there any any inspiration sources, or uh, does it matter to you? Um, I, I was in the boat. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead. Look, uh, it's a red light. Um, I was in the Boden Museum, Bode Museum in Berlin, and and saw this Riemann Schneider um, saints. And they were absolutely e extraordinary um, because I think that, that the way in which uh, you could say the same is true uh, of Mantegna um, or Masaccio, the way that, that Riemenschneider um, is able to give real psychological intensity to the nature of uh, a, 
St. Luke. Um, and yes, of course, I get extraordinary. Um, Tina de Camayano, for example, I find his work, or um, one of the, uh, the, uh, the Mayano um, panels on the west front of Orvieto Cathedral moved me immensely. Um, this is the birth of Eve. Um, Adam is asleep on a flowery bank. God is lifting Eve, who still has her feet lost in Adam's chest. And with one hand he's saying, come forth, be happy, come into the world, come into the garden. And then with the other hand he's saying, but do no evil. Anyway, uh, I mean, I'm just talking about a particular work and how it inspired me. It seemed to me that this was a, this was a parable. This was a parable in a way about our unconsciousness, our lack of responsibility for the future. Here, here is this moment when God and Eve are making this compact. Uh, God knows very well that this is the moment of the division of sexes, the, the, <laughs> the beginning of the, 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 the burden of work, uh, the, the fall, everything is predicted in this moment. Uh, and Adam is out of it. Um, and it seemed to me, anyway, I, I think that, that you could say that I was susceptible to perhaps a rereading. I mean, uh, that obviously, this, this, this re my reading, my contemporary reading of a, of a medieval, post medieval, um, extraordinary bit of carving. I mean, it's a very, very um, beautiful. Uh, sculpture or relief um, was a, a reinvention of a parable that would have meant, meant something very different uh, to the perhaps the person that made it. Um, but I'm I I am very moved. I I, I went to a monastic school um, and. Father Edmund, it was a Benedictine school. His speciality was, was uh, medieval funerary sculpture. And, and, and that made a huge impression upon me, aged 14 or whatever I was. Uh, this lecture with black and white slides of bishops in all their finery on the upper part of a funerary sculpture and then being eaten by worms and rats. Uh, skeletal, disincarnated bodies below. Um, there's an extraordinary exhibition on at the moment at the, at the British Museum uh, called Rodin and, uh, and the Parthenon Marbles, in which there's a sculpture of uh, Achilles, uh, which has been extraordinarily eroded and there's something about that that connected back to the to the to the medieval funerary sculpture for me that here 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 is a, a work that was in Rodin's collection that he admired because of the way that the elements had taken taken hold of its perfect surface and turned it into, in a way, a work of the wind and the rain and the sun, and yet it still hold, held this, this uh, kind of attitude of, I don't know, alert awareness. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, of course I get a lot of inspiration from, uh, from the history of sculpture, but, but, but not just from Euro European sculpture. I, I, I was very, um, I, I was and remain immensely touched and, and moved by, by Gupta and Kola work from, from India. And I think, I think, I think of, of really Pala, 
Pala Gupta and, and Kola uh, sculpture as having invented the idea of the abstract body. You could say that Khmer, so King Jayavardhanam the seventh of, of uh, the great Khmer empire of the 11th century, um, who presided over an incredible flowering of, of, of sculpture. I, I, I would recommend everyone to go to Angkor Wat and particularly to Angkor Tom, uh, this city that is, it's a place, it's a real place that was a city that in its time uh, had something like 500,000 inhabitants. But the city itself was a map, the map of the lower and the higher worlds um, that combined extraordinary um, yeah, mercantile exchange with um, a very rich uh, spiritual life. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I get, I get a lot of inspiration from, from old stuff. <laughs> what we really are talking about, uh, I think, is also about really the value of art. How art over uh, periods of time in any parts of the world, of course the world that I know is particularly European, uh, has uh, had so many meanings for us. Uh, as you probably know, we have an exhibition of uh, Yuri Kolash Palatskinsky, and he, at the time of a, a huge crisis in this country uh, and beyond, uh, constantly returns to historical works of art, um, which he uses as part of the collages. And I think for him, it really represents the value. I mean, this is what we are holding on to. This is what will help us to overcome whatever we have to live through. Uh, Marius, I'm so sorry, but I have to call on you. We have this amazing director of master's collection, Marius Winsela, who sits here. And of course, he is so knowledgeable about these works and actually helped me to uh, kind of analyze some of the pieces in Yuri Collage's work. Um, can I ask you maybe to say a, a few words about the significance uh, of art? And I know, and I know you told me that you were um, already loving uh, spaces like churches and art at the age of six, right? So here we go. You, you were ahead of me. I started to be really interested in the age of eight, but you at the age of six, so. Thank you, it's, it's very difficult <laughs> to ask something, but for me, maybe it's more important not to speak only about values, but more, or about values in a sense of, of eternity or of long time, Values also, I think, for for Yuri Kolas, it was very important to have this, this old things as a orientation, or also for for working and destruc destruction of these things, and to make something new from old. And this is maybe also a question um, now to you, Sir Anthony, um, about this this strong feeling of spirit, or how you are working with this space in this, this formerly church um, and to make here a, a combination of three works for me as a, a person who is more orientated to the old art was also very interesting to see how you are transforming your, um, uh, your body in this, this huge uh, work uh, feel or feeling. I think feel, I feel or feel. Um, and for me, it was re remembering very strong also this topic of Christ's body in the grave uh, cloth. And this, the, the question about the, the own body as a, mm, yes, as a vessel for, for mind, of course. And uh, 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 
was it so that you you think about also this this um, spiritual things? What is the uh, the image of of human mind and the transformation to to something what will be more eternal than than only the the the, the matter now in the present? Big questions. The, the, I think, you know, I was brought up a Catholic and I was told that I had an eternal soul um, and that uh, if I did God's will, um, uh, you know, I would, I would live with him in the big heaven up, up there. And um, I think I've put that magical thinking uh, aside, but I think the the fundamental uh, thoughts about incarnation um, and the transformative, which could be at the center of, you know, transubstantiation and 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 um, the mystical rites of of Christianity. Um, I think if we think of them uh, more in a psychological or more open way, uh, I think they're still very very relevant and useful. I don't, I don't like the idea that uh, somebody else's suffering is going to redeem my soul. I think that, that we have to do it for ourselves. So the, the idea that the body is a place of constant change and transformation that we, on some level, have to be conscious of, but also have to be conscious of as a microcosm of many things that we have no control over. In other words, uh, that, um, yeah, the, the, we call it my body, but it doesn't belong to us. It's a temporary loan, but it gives us the chance through incarnation to use the body as a workshop for consciousness. And you could say, you know, uh, yeah, I, I was brought up by monks and, and that, the, the, this, uh, this combination in a monastic rule of uh, intellectual work, um, uh, the work of the scriptorum, uh, the, uh, the understanding of uh, classical text from from doesn't matter from Greece or from the from the desert fathers um, combined with an idea of working with the hands with uh, making uh, or farming um, Cistercians yeah used to have to grow their own food uh, and then um, some collective uh, spiritual work, um, a form of uh, collective meditation or singing, um, uh, yeah, saying the 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 breviary um, prayers of matins, known sex, terse. Um, that idea of a of a of a contemplative life, I think you know, that. That strikes me as being a good model for an artist's life too. Uh, you make something. You then have the, in a way, the responsibility, but also duty to then reflect upon what you've made. Uh, you then, if you think it's worthy of being given, it should be given. It should be shared because the only point of making a work is that it should be seen and experienced and and I think that you know you could you could fold those two ideas together very happily so the, you know the I think the I, I, I think I was lucky to to um, be educated by people that didn't have anything to sell uh, I wasn't, they wasn't being trained for a job. They thought that they were 
helping, uh, um, in their terms, a soul discover itself. And, and for that, I'm very grateful. Um, I think this this whole question of of, of um, you know what what does religion give? It gives you a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, but also a moral order. I think I think that we we can't stay in that kind of childlike dependency, and uh, somehow uh, I I think that the the urges of my my work are not dissimilar to the to the 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 responsibilities of religion, but it's of a very different order. I think that that um, these are free objects that can be used for those who want to, uh, uh, as as a kind of stimulus for 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 contemplation and 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 thought, and hopefully also feeling. Um, it's an invitation to slow down a bit because sculpture is still and silent and um, depends in a way on you spending time and moving around it and in a way doing the work of re, 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 reconnecting maybe things that are only partially connected like like in this exhibition here I think there are you know, two works on paper and one sculpture on the floor that uh, have a kind of uh, relationship to the space but I'm very very aware that this exhibition so-called exhibition I mean it falls you know, you, you could say that it falls entirely within the conventions of the way that space was used. So we have two vertical surfaces that are not dissimilar to an altarpiece and a, and, a, and a work on the floor that is not dissimilar to, to, a, to a funerary sculpture. Um, so I haven't moved very far, is really what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. Sir Anthony, I would like to ask you if, uh, if uh, environmental impact or ecology is an uh, important question for you in your art. You, you mean our, our uh, effect on, yeah. the, on, yeah. on the environment? Because I'm, I'm also a sculptor and I'm thinking about it a lot of time. Yeah, I, I, I think about it. On a daily basis, we 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 learned um, last week that we'd lost something horrendous, like 92% of our uh, insect uh, population in in Britain, um, and as a result, we're losing our bird life. Um, I think that uh, the loss of the deep Arctic pump that uh, keeps the the Gulf Stream in place, the, uh, the, the, the warming and, and acidification of the oceans, um, the, the potential loss of the West Greenland ice shelf and, and, and uh, the same uh, in Antarctica uh, and the potential of massive sea rise, uh, it's, it's, it's all there. And, and we were told about the tipping point 20 years ago and we've passed it. Um, and it's very, this, this issue about uh, how do we live now uh, responsibly. Uh, I think we can do all that stuff. We all do that stuff. I'm sure we all do that stuff. I have as many solar panels as the building that I work in can take. Um, but until our representatives, until... Uh, yeah, politicians uh, take this seriously. Um, uh, we, we we will not have that long. Um, I think that we are we, we we are at the point where we are defining the conditions and the length with which our species will survive. There have been mass exterminations, uh, extinctions. Um, sorry, extinctions, um, before. Um, but they've never been caused by a single species. Uh, and 
you know, the, 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 this, this question of what are we and how will we live, they are really urgent. I don't, I don't have any answers, but, but, but the, you know, it's, it's so very, very obvious that we should not be, as it were, using up the combined 3.7 billion years of solar memory that is locked into fossil fuels. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're, we're basically burning the photosynthesis of 3.7 billion years of uh, biospheric life when we can access that energy of the biggest thermonuclear generator in the neighborhood, the sun, directly. I mean, it's so obvious. I'm hoping that human population will, will stabilize. Uh, I'm hoping that um, this regression into nationalism uh, and uh, a, a variety of um, religious fanaticism uh, will, I mean, it, that, that trend is uh, itself an expression of our uncertainty and, in a way, fear of our own influence on the, on, on the, on the planet that surrounds us. Um, I think that art cannot be uh, a medium of political agitation. But it is a call to awareness. And it is a call uh, for us to be um, uh, alert to how vulnerable we are to a destabilized uh, elemental system. And Thank you. Thank you. Was that really boring? I'm, 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 I'm sorry. We, we seem to have ended up in a, in a rather well. I mean, it is the big question that is facing. I mean, I'm, I'm about to um, bow out. Um, I'm concerned about my children and my children's children. I became a grandfather ten months ago, and uh, I, you know, with with Brexit and Trump and Kim Jong Il. Uh, as the kind of prime prime kind of stories of our time, it's just a bit difficult to be optimistic. Anyway, thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>